You repeat after me the oath of allegiance to our Führer. I consecrate my life to Hitler. I am ready to sacrifice my life for Hitler. I am ready to die for Hitler. I am ready to die for Hitler. My savior, my Führer. My savior, my Führer. Brad, I've got to know. Was Christine a communist when you knew her? I'd never ask a lady her politics. Now can we start thinking about us? Are you a member of the Communist Party? Or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? It's unfortunate and tragic that I have to teach this committee the that's basic principles the of American. That's not the question. That's not the question. Why should you be so frightened? We are Jewish. <laughs> Do you remember how it was in Germany? Oh. Well, maybe I could help you. In their 1942 picture, Once Upon a Honeymoon, RKO offered the public Ginger Rogers married to a Nazi, but saved in the nick of time by fearless newspaper man Cary Grant. Not before a string of hair-raising adventures, including being mistaken for Jews and put into an internment camp. This is terrible. Can anybody help us? Saved from the gas chamber, the Hollywood stars process across war-torn Europe, falling in love on the way, but also finding time to run spy missions for the free French. Holy smoke. This is the answer to a crossword puzzle. You're looking at the Nazi cabinet's secret code. That's good, huh? Perhaps it was an RKO's finest hour. But the period we're about to cover is a confusing one. With a mix of that kind of tasteless schlock and a small group of movies that demonstrated a genuine social awareness and commitment followed by the backlash, the beginning of the Hollywood witch hunts. While all this was going on, RKO was turning out its bread and butter westerns, including Robert Mitchum's first appearance in drag and developing a whole new genre of movie making, what we now call film noir. We'll be talking to some of the people at RKO who took a leading part in all of this. But first, the story so far. Orson Welles has been sacked by RKO leaving behind his masterpieces, Kane and the Ambersons. A new boss has taken over at the studio, Charles Kerner, businessman and entrepreneur, not a filmmaker. It's June 1942, and America has been at war for seven months. The smash hit of 1942 from RKO's B picture unit was Edward Dimitrik's Hitler's Children. It cost $205,000 and it made over three million at the box office. How come that was such a successful picture? I mean, especially with a title called Hitler's Children. I would like to think it was my work. <laughs> I have no idea. You know, who knows why a picture catches on? The, the original title of that, it came from a book. It had a little, practically nothing to do with the book, except for a few sequences, called Education for Death. 
Now, death in the title is, was considered a, a death at the box office. Uh, so uh, we played around with a few titles, and Hitler at, at that time, the name Hitler in the title was considered uh, <laughs> death at the box office too. But they decided to call it Hitler's Children for some reason or other. It, uh, it took off. It only played in, in Canada, uh, the United States, and Britain, and still made a, a fortune. My country is of the sweet land of Until 1942, of course, the war had been happening to other people, thousands of miles away. When America joined in, Hollywood made its own efforts to bring home to the American public the full horrors of Nazism. The result was a series of pictures that now look catastrophically naive. Stories of real-life horror and atrocity translated into the language of the Hollywood B-movie. Hold on. I can't let them hurt you. There's no other way. There is one. It would protect you and it would satisfy them. The most they demand is that you have a child for the state. They never inquire who the father is. Carl. We love each other, darling. I can't marry you now. It's impossible. But later, perhaps when things work out... Don't you see how wrong that is? How deceitful. I only see that I love you, Anna. But it wouldn't be our child. It would be Hitler's. Just another child to die for the state. Oh, please, Anna. That's part of the confusion that we mustn't think about. Each generation must look out for itself. Oh, no, no, Carl. That's where you're wrong. That's where you and Hitler and Goering and Goebbels and all the rest of you are wrong. The idea behind the big picture unit was to make money, not spend a lot, so that you didn't have to make a lot to make a profit. And, uh... Indeed, the B picture unit made a lot of money for the studio because they didn't invest very much. Uh, the pictures are very inexpensive in those days. Also in those days, uh, it was very hard to make a failure. Everything worked. Every movie was virtually was a success. The B picture unit followed up their enormous hit, Hitler's Children, with another enticingly titled picture, The Master Race. And with the bombing of Pearl Harbor, they had found a new race of villains to pull in the crowds. Well, Miss Brayton, are you ready to confess that everything you wrote for your papers from China was a lie? I wrote no lies. It was true, every word of it. Yes, torture is an old art with us, my son. Edward Dimitrik's tender comrade showed the other side of the war, female labor in the factories back home. To Ginger Rogers, it seemed like a good idea at the time. I thought this was a good film to show what women were doing while their men were away. And uh, I didn't think that was bad to have an audience see that women are not just sitting at home doing nothing. They're really out helping build the machines that the men were using during the war. It's hard to believe such an innocent storyline, a group of young women pooling their resources to make their lives more tolerable, was later interpreted by many, including Miss Rogers herself, as pink propaganda. You know, all of us together, we put out a lot of money each month for rent. What do you pay, Helen? Twenty-two fifty. I pay eighteen. What about you, Barbara? Thirty-two fifty. You see, I like gaudy things. This sequence is about the nearest thing to a political statement in the whole movie. Spot the incipient communism. 93 bucks. How do you like that? 93 bucks for a bunch of rat holes. Well, for that kind of dough, we could have a real house with a dining room and a kitchen and a living room and a bedroom apiece and furnished. It might work. But it's only fair to point out that we're all different people and there might be a clash of personalities occasionally. We'd have to find some way of adjusting any disputes that might come up. Well, that ought to be simple. We could take a vote. We could run the joint like a democracy. And if anything comes up, we'll just call a meeting. Oh, gee, kids, that'd be wonderful. There were many things in that film that I really didn't agree with. And um, I felt that we were being undermined by some um, radical writers. I didn't like that, because I'm anything but uh, radical. In fact, one of their phrases in that mottos was share and share alike, which became a very anti-American thing later on. But uh, at that, you know, that, that was the kind of a film it was. We're all for one and one for all. Yeah, that, the same old thing. <laughs>
That, of course, later on, they, they would hold that against you or something. Absolutely, yeah. And it wasn't my idea. It was, uh, it was a general... It's uh, what we did during the war, didn't, didn't we? They did it in England. They did it everywhere. You know, they had to. You, that was one of the good things about the war, was that we all cooperated and we were all going for the same thing. It was in the very different climate of the post-war years, a time of paranoia, fears, and suspicion, that movies like Tender Comrade were scrutinized and reinterpreted as communist propaganda. We'll see later how the makers of that film were brought to account during the most unhappy episode in the history of Hollywood. But during the early 40s, it was the B picture unit that helped keep RKO afloat. It wasn't only jackboots and Japanese tortures that brought the audiences in. It was a string of incredibly successful low-budget films that still rank among the most ingenious and imaginative ever made by the studio. They were all produced by one man. Val Luton. Thank you for coming at so late an hour, Dr. Judd. I phoned you because I'm troubled. I think you can help me. How much do you believe about the cat people? The uh, cat people? A uh, story Mrs. Reed told me. Yes. I believe, my dear Miss Moore, exactly as I told Mrs. Reed. The story is a product of her own fear, her own uh, overworked imagination. What would you say, Dr. Judd, if I were to tell you that I believe Arena's story? Yes. Twice I've been followed by something that was not human. Cat People tells the story of a young woman tormented by the fear that she's descended from an ancient race who transform into savage beasts when their passions are aroused. It's an intelligent psychological thriller with its central character, played by Simone Simone, a study in sexual frigidity. Luton's way was to tell a good yarn, but to underpin it with atmosphere and character. Well, he was a marvelous man. He was a, had been a newspaperman, a writer. He had published, uh, I think, six or seven uh, kind of swashbuckling novels before he was 20 years of age. A very, very uh, inventive, very creative, very well-read man, fine background. And uh, he did so much, contributed so much to all the films that he, that he made. And he, he made quite an impact in the early 40s at RKO with a series of what were then known as psychological horror films where you didn't have the monsters and the manifestations, but it was all that story of uh, the greatest fear, as Val's, Val's thesis was, the greatest fear people have is the fear of the unknown. In Luton Pictures, the tension builds with subtlety and often marvelous skill. Cat People was directed by Jacques Turner. Dearie, are you all right? It's nothing. It was dark down here and Mrs. Reed coming in unexpectedly frightened me. I'm terribly sorry. Now so don't go. I'm coming right out. Sorry to have disturbed you, Alice. I missed you and Oliver and I thought you might know where he is. We waited for you at the museum. You'll probably find him at home. If you don't mind, then I'll run on. Could I have my robe, please? Sure. Gee whiz, honey, it's torn to ribbons. Val was given a slum in the corner of the studio and told to go ahead and make these the goddamn pictures. Well, his first picture was The Cat People, which was in gigantic success. And uh, not only were his first pictures a gigantic success financially, but they got picked up by the critics, especially James Agee, who was our leading critic. And all the critics began to write uh, these serious pieces about the 
genius of Val Luton and his capacity to make these wonderful, uh, un inexpensive, but free and imaginative pictures. And Val was uh, in clover. He was, uh, he, he was happy as a clam. He was totally free. He could take a cutter like Robert Wise and give him a picture to direct. Uh, and nobody, as long as he didn't spend any money, nobody paid any attention. He always uh, rewrote most of the scripts at the last. The shooting script was usually very much Val Luton, although he would never take credit, never put his name up there. When we finally did the body snatcher that I did for him, he had done so much of the work that the Writers Guild said there had to be some other name on it besides Philip McDonald, who was the credited writer. But Val refused to take his own name. He called himself Carlos Keith. So if you see that film, Carlos Keith is really Val Luton. The Body Snatcher was a faithful adaptation of a Robert Louis Stevenson story. Luton brought to all his projects a touch of literacy that was rare for the exploitation market. When Charles Kerner handed him the idea for I Walked With a Zombie, he was depressed for a day. Then he brightened up and said to a friend, they'll never recognize it, but I'm going to give them Jane Eyre in the West Indies. Fort Holland. From the gate it seemed strangely dreamlike. The garden had life of its own. I was to know all the nooks and crannies of that great house, to love them or hate them according to what happened there. In that house I was to hear a strange confession a confession only madness could have wrung from the lips of a sane person. And yet it was in the same room, with the candles lit, that I made the discovery of my own love. New happiness deep through the heart. My room. I can still remember my delight, unpacking, getting ready for dinner. And yet all the while I wondered at the stillness of Fort Holland. The fact that I saw no one on the garden paths or in the rooms. Val Luton was a shy man, physically shy. He didn't like to be touched or even to shake hands, and he was a meticulous producer. He supervised every single detail of his productions, set design, makeup, costume, script, music, and of course, photography. He had very particular ideas for the way his pictures should look. He was a great one for, for studying uh, the old masters and the artists, you know, for the look of these films. Uh, he, we studied uh, Daumier, uh, Fritz, uh, Hogarth, and others of that nature. And to get the, the look of the people, the way they dress, and the faces, and the types that the fine artists had done uh, centuries before sometime. Boris Karloff and Anna Lee star in Bedlam, a horror picture set in an 18th century asylum in London. It's full of period detail based closely on 18th century engravings. But like all of Luton's pictures, it was made on a shoestring budget. Many of his sets were cleverly recycled from other people's pictures. Are they not witty, Mistress Bath? Oh, look at the frolic this one treats himself to. All day long, weaving nets to catch peacocks for the royal dinner. They're all so lonely. They're all in themselves and by themselves. They pay no heed to us. Uh, you notice that. They have their world and we have ours. After a few years of this, he was so famous and so successful that all his friends and agents and everybody came to him and said, now you've got to stop doing these cheapies and you, you better go and make some really big pictures. And he made a contract with Paramount and he went in as a regular line producer and he hated it. Once away from the little beat picture empire he'd created, Luton's energies and imagination began to fail. He no longer felt in control. And after his RKO years, he made nothing of any significance. He died of a heart attack in 1951. He was 46. Not all of the wartime B pictures from RKO were destined to turn into cult movies like Val Luton's. They had to maintain a regular quota of pot boilers and cast them, despite the scarcity of acting talent during the war years. In 1944, Wanting to increase the flow of B-Westerns, Charles Kerner acquired the services of a young actor who had been making a modest impact in a series of Hopalong Cassidy films. Robert Mitchum had only recently turned to acting after working as a nightclub bouncer, longshoreman, engine room hand, and promoter for a California astrologer. Having lived such an independent existence, he was unprepared for the close attentions of RKO. First of all, they asked me if I, if I, uh, why I hadn't had my nose fixed. 
And I just simply said it hadn't occurred to me I could breathe through it fairly well. Then we're going to change my name to Robert Marshall. And, uh, you know, they thought the, like, Taylor, Gable, Garland, you know. And the man who uh, wanted to change my name was named Herman Schlum. So he uh, changed his son's name to Marshall Schlum. And everything worked out. What was your first contract? 40 weeks out of 52 for $350 a week. What was your first film for Arcadian? The first one I was in drag, actually, in the beginning of the picture. You look good to me. Well, I had a, you know, sort of a, a prairie style uh, flouncing skirt, and I was done up in drag. You for me, ma'am. I like a big. Well, now they don't come too big for me either, bud. <laughs> That's good. Got a voice to match your figure. I'm buying you the first drink, sweetie pie. Oh, my, that was really good. What is that, sarsaparilla? When? Wait for the signal. Uh, you were saying? I got a feeling you and I are going to have a lot of fun, big girl. Well, you never can tell. It was sort of like a club, Archeo. They had, uh, commitments, expensive commitments, you know, like with uh, Cary Grant, Crosby, people like that. And uh, then they had what was oh, more or less a, a B factory, which we did. We had the Westerns and uh, Larry Turney did Dillinger and, you know, that, or that sort of thing. You know. And it was, you know, just a good functioning factory. The f crew was very familiar. We worked with the same crew more or less all the time. And it was uh, sort of down home. What sort of areas could you choose how, what you wanted? Could, where you, could you choose the directors you wanted to work with? Could you... really makes no difference. No difference? Still doesn't. You don't believe that the director makes the picture? I have no idea. Possibly he does, you know. But I have the same uh, general attitude that uh, John Houston taught me. And Johnny said, uh, they want the bad pictures, we can we can make them too, kid. They want them bad, we can make them cost a little more, but if they want them bad, we can make them bad. It doesn't concern me. Mitchum continued in a series of Zane Gray pictures until he went into the Army in 1945. His place in RKO's bread and butter westerns was instantly taken by another young actor, James Warren, so that the flow of product should remain unbroken. When Mitchum was demobbed a year later, he came back to a different RKO and a very different America. In Edward Dimitrik's Till the End of Time, Mitchum plays a modern-day cowboy discharged at the end of the war from the U.S. Marines and about to face a painful readjustment back to his old life. Hi, Bill. What are you doing here? Oh, I just breezed into town. I thought I'd look you up. Why didn't you wait in the house? Came to call on you, not your folks. Come here, get your hand caught. I need 20 bucks. Are you in any trouble? For $20, you want the story of my life? You look awful. You look cute. Come on in the house and we'll have a beer. Well, it ain't polite to drink and run. Where are you running to? You're asking too many questions, Cliff. It had to do with lonesomeness. It had to do with the people who came back and suddenly found themselves with nothing to do. They had been used to doing a certain kind of thing for four years, and now there was, uh, they didn't know what the hell they were doing. They were nowhere. They were in, they were in a, a, a lost world, you know, and um, uh, which can be, uh, psychologically certainly <laughs> very very disorienting and not too many people were paying attention to that uh, and uh, it was something worth talking about till the end of time was the first production for rko for a writer turned executive dory sherry his assistant at rko was bill fadiman the era in which mr sherry and the then rko functioned was of course the post-war period the post-war period in america as I believe in most civilized countries, was a period of great awakening, of great consternation, of great regret 
of what had accomplished, if, if anything had been accomplished by that particular war, and consequently of a kind of a social unrest and of the revealing and the opening up and exposure of many problems which had been either pushed under a rug or at least not revealed to any large number of human beings. Sherry was merely representative of the, of the liberal of that period, the cultivated liberal, the man who would not throw bombs but would throw words, and he felt words were vitally important. How would you like to have a bonus of $200 a month income for as long as you live? Without the labor union. Yeah, you fellas know that 15% of every paycheck you get goes to those foreign-born labor racketeers. That's the kind of a free country we were fighting for. Of course, we don't know whether you men are eligible. You see, we have certain restrictions. What does that mean? No Catholics, Jews, or Negroes. You know, we had a friend named Maxie Klein. Maxie was here, he'd probably spit right in your eye. Yeah? Yeah, but Maxie's dead in Guadalcanal. So just for him, I'm gonna spit in your eye. While films like Till the End of Time showed a new willingness to tackle social issues head on, Another picture by Edward Dimitrik had opened up a whole new genre of movie making. Again, it drew its inspiration from the post-war world. It was the hugely influential film noir, Farewell, My Lovely, based on the book by Raymond Chandler that brought together again producer Adrian Scott and Dimitrik, who was currently enjoying the title, The Hottest Director in Hollywood. I remember you as a pretty noisy little fella, son. All of a sudden, you get quiet. You lost your book of answers, or you're just waiting for your lawyer? Maybe you don't think murder looks so good on you. Maybe I didn't do it. Maybe he didn't do it, Molly. Now look, Marlowe, we're arraigning you. It ain't personal. We don't like you, but it ain't personal. We were appearing at some college here, and somebody in the audience, one of the students, said, uh, tell us about film noir. And I said, what's film noir? And he said, you're one of the founders of film noir. I said, really? And uh, I, I didn't know what the hell it was. You know, we had used... Um, uh, a certain style, it was, came naturally to me. We, one of the reasons we started doing that kind of film was because films had always been, you know, even a secretary in, a, in an MGM film lived in a $1,000 a, a month apartment at a time when $1,000 a month was a hell of a lot of money. And uh, we wanted to get into some of the poorer areas. I think it all came from that. It came from a concern for the people. Uh, uh, and uh, the only way to do it was through a mystery story. Well, certainly Chandler and Hammett were very influential because, again, they were writing, they were writing film noir, if you want to use that phrase, you know, before, uh, before we, we were making it. And uh, it led the way. Uh, uh, Maltese Falcon, which was made three years before ours, was a, a wonderful film. Uh, it didn't start a trend the way ours did for some strange reason, but I consider it an even better film than, than Murder, My Sweet. There's no question that, that uh, you know, reading his stuff, that's why we use a narration in that, because we wanted the Chandler flavor. I just found out all over again how big this city is. My feet hurt, and my mind felt like a plumber's handkerchief. The office bottle hadn't sparked me up, so I'd taken out my little black book and decided to go grouse hunting. Nothing like soft shoulders to improve my morale. The soft shoulders had a date, but she thought she could do something about that and was going to check right back. There's something about the dead silence of an office building at night. Not quite real. The traffic down below was something that didn't have anything to do with me. Who knows what the forces are in, in society that, that uh, instigate these, these uh, changes. But there was a style that started in the 40s uh, by the young directors, uh, some who, of whom were my contemporaries, others had preceded me. Uh, and it was a much more realistic approach to filmmaking and to the kind of heroes that we were used to seeing before. These were more real people, uh, uh, heroes that had flaws in their characters who were not always just the, 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 the knight in shining armor, Mr. Clean. Uh, they, they had other emotions and other goals. 
I'm a little beat for this kind of work. You know, I think you're nuts. You go barging around without a very clear idea what you're doing. Everybody bats you down, smacks you over the head, fills you full of stuff, and you keep right on hitting between tackle and end. I don't think you even know which side you're on. I don't know which side anybody's on. I don't even know who's playing today. And also, was, there was, seemed to be more interest in, uh, interest in the, the uh, kind of the underbelly of society and the, the uh, dark corners and quirky alleys that we were getting into then. We were exploring those avenues, which really, up to that time, were more or less avoided. Suddenly, she wasn't drunk anymore. Her hand was steady and she was cool. Like somebody making funeral arrangements for a murder. We got into this business of, of making more hard-bitten, realistic stories with clever twists in the plot. that things were never as they seemed to be. There was always a surprise, and almost every scene we had a surprise, that we got, were shocked that this is not a detective, this is a killer, and this is not a killer, this is a detective, and everybody is wearing a different hat suddenly, and you don't know whether they're telling the truth or not telling the truth. It was that kind of milieu that we were getting into, which we had never really done before. My name is Jeff Markham, and I haven't talked to anybody who hasn't tried to sell me something for 10 days. If I don't talk, I think. It's too late in life for me to start thinking. I could go down to the cliff and look at the sea like a good tourist. But it's no good if there isn't somebody you can turn to and say, nice view, huh? It's the same with the churches, the relics, the moonlight, or a Cuba Libra. Nothing in the world is any good unless you can share it. Maybe you want to go home. Maybe that's why I'm here. Is it? Well, as always, Jose Rodriguez. If it gets too lonely, there's a little cantina down the street called Pablo's. It's nice and quiet. The man there plays American music for a dollar. Sit bourbon and shut your eyes. It's like a little place on 56th Street. I wear my earrings. I sometimes go there. Jacques Tourneur, uh, at that time, didn't speak English very well. And, uh, he, in speaking of the part, he said to me, do you know the word impassive? And I said, yes, I know that word. He says, that's what I want, impassive. I said, yes, I, 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 I know, I can do that. He says, no big eyes. No big eyes. No big eyes. Well, I did throw in a few big eyes anyway. I couldn't help myself. But anyway, I tried not to. And he said, first half, good girl. Last half, bad girl. <laughs> That's all I needed to know. And that was the direction. And then he stuck to that, and it was wonderful. It was easy for me, too, because I knew what I was doing. <laughs> I just had to figure out when that half was. No, I knew when I killed my first victim. You wouldn't have killed him. You would have beaten him up and thrown him off. You didn't have to do it. You wouldn't have killed him. He'd have been against us, gone to wit. Bob Mitchum was a lovely, lovely man. He, he really looked after me. I mean, I, what did I know? You know, if, if my clothes didn't fit right, I didn't care. I got this great part. And <laughs> he would say, why, why is that? Why is that hanging on her? Look, look at her. I mean, why? Can't somebody come and bring a needle and thread here and get that to fit her right, you know? Or, uh, what is that? That's not on her head right, or her hair, you know, he would look after me. He'd say, you have to defend yourself. Ask for makeup. Do, well, I'd go around, you know, with, with hardly any, you know, at the end of the day, if it was chewed off, it was chewed off, you know. He'd, come in here and check her, you know. And uh, he was wonderful. He was just great. 
turn around. You're on the wrong track, pal. Wrong track with the wrong man. Bob Mitchell was going to do a picture, about to do a picture with Elizabeth Scott called The Big Steel. They had wardrobed for the part. Uh, they had done everything, you know, whatever you have to do, rehearsal or whatever. They were to start the following Tuesday. On Thursday, Bob was arrested for consuming a marijuana cigarette. And, oh, I mean, the heavens opened up. Actor Robert Mitchum, actress Lila Leeds, and two companions were arrested last night on suspicion of violating the narcotics laws. Mitchum gave his age as 31 and his address is 3372 Oak Glen Drive. Arresting officers of the Federal Narcotics Bureau said they had been keeping an eye on Mitchum for eight months and Miss Leeds had been under suspicion for six months. Mitchum immediately surrendered a package of 15 marijuana cigarettes and Miss Leeds surrendered several others according to the officers. Elizabeth Scott decided she would not be a party to this and she withdrew from the picture. And they scouted around all over town, and I know because I was very close with Joan Bennett in those days. She was offered, this one was, everybody was offered this part. So they were desperate. And finally, someone said, what about Jane Greer? Um, now you've done it. What'd you have to get me into it for? In the what? I don't know what I got myself into. The Inspector General's office. You're going to have some explaining to do. Mitchum was sentenced to 60 days in jail, followed by two years probation. The court made a special dispensation that he could do some of the shooting for the big steel before serving his sentence. It did have an effect on your career, did it not, though? I, it uh, probably, yeah, it made it a bit more circumstantial. Well, I couldn't play, for instance, Eagle Scouts or uh, Baptist Preachers. Or, but uh, I tell you one thing, it uh, certainly enlisted an enormous number of new fans. RKO was so nervous about how the cinema-going public would react to Mitchum's misdemeanor that they sent him on a nationwide promotional tour to test public reaction. He acted like Mitchum and he served his sentence and came out and everybody thought that was the end of Mitchum's career. Well, it wasn't at all. Mitchum, uh, everybody was kind of fascinated by this. Now, maybe if it had been Farley Granger or some attractive young uh, guy with a different kind of image, it would have been a different thing. But Mitchum, they like, they like Mitchum to be a little dangerous, a little rec reckless, a little the kind of things that he, he was. That's the character he played, and that's the kind of person he was. Meanwhile, the team of Adrian Scott and Edward Dimitrik were continuing to develop the film noir vein and they were encouraged by the liberal Dory Sherry, now RKO production chief, to include a social dimension to their stories. Crossfire dealt with the concealment of a racially motivated murder. You've got nothing to worry about as long as we keep our story straight. Now, the... Marty, I can't, I can't say there was no argument. Mitch was still up there when you went after Sam. The cops are going to pick up Mitch, and Mitch is going to say... Mitch won't say nothing. Mitch was Stinko. He won't remember exactly. Nobody knows exactly, except me and you. What'd you have to go after the guy for? Crime any money? Why'd you have to start in? No I can't. Jew is gonna tell me how to drink his stinking liquor. Well, it was tough to get it made. Actually, strangely enough, the original book, uh, The Brick Fox Hall, uh, by Richard Brooks, was um, about a homosexual who's killed because the killer hates homosexuals. Well, at that time, of course, we couldn't even talk about homosexuals. But even if we had been able to, I think it was Adrian Scott, the producer, I think it was his idea to make him a Jew rather than a, than a homosexual and deal with anti-Semitism uh, rather than any kind of feeling about homosexuality. Did you uh, have some sort of an argument with Samuels? What was there to argue about? The liquor was good, everything was okay. You've never met him before. No, I told you, I just met him in the bar. I never even seen him before. You sure? Well, sure, I'm sure. Of course, I've seen a lot of guys like him. Like what? Oh, you know, guys that played it safe during the war, scrounged around keeping themselves in civvies, got swell apartments, swell dames, you know the kind. I'm not sure that I do, just what kind? Oh, you know. Some of them are named Samuels. Some of them got funnier names. You'll be at the Stewart Hotel? Sure, I got nowhere else to go. I'm sponging a bunk from one of the boys. You coming, Keeley? There are one or two more questions I'd like to ask Sergeant Keeley.
You ought to look at the casualty list sometime. There are a lot of funny names there, too. Hmm? I said Monty was illiterate. I said he ought to read more. I was just philosophizing. I'm but... not interested in philosophy. I'm trying to solve a murder. And we had to agree to, as I say, make it very cheaply. Now, I will also, uh, this is interesting, by the way, I think from a technical point of view, I wanted to make it very well. So I looked into the records and I found that normally on, a, on, a, on the average picture at that time, 80% of the time was taken in preparation and lighting and all that kind of thing, and perhaps 20 minutes with rehearsal and with getting the film. I wanted to reverse that. So in the first place, I had to get a cameraman who was willing to light very quickly. And as the photographer will understand, it was a lot faster to light the people and then throw a couple of big shadows on the wall and you had your thing. In the old days, if they were to light a wall, they would, every fixture would be lit, you know, would have its own three-point lighting. In this case, uh, we didn't have the time. So we got that kind of shadowy, high contrast lighting and used wide angle lenses to get character, not for depth of focus, because that I hate, but to get different kinds of character. In Crossfire, I started out with Bob Ryan with a 50 millimeter lens, because I wanted him to be perfectly normal. As we gradually went along, I went to a 40, to a 35, and eventually in the last third of the picture, he was everything I shot with him was with a 25, to that slight subliminal distortion, which made him a different kind of a character. And uh, that's a very essential part of film noir, which most people don't know. I shot that in 20 days, which was a B picture schedule by anything. And uh, I had Robert Young, who got at that time $150,000. I had Robert Ryan, I had Robert Mitchum, plus another cast, and we had a budget of 500,000. So you can imagine about almost 400,000 of that went into cast alone, not counting producer, director, writer, and all that. So I had less than $100,000 with which to make the picture. And that allowed us to shoot for 20 days. So um, uh, we had, as I say, we had the light quick, uh, had, and yet the, uh, the, the lighting is very effective in that thing. And I never shot a full eight-hour day, because I don't believe in it. I think I averaged seven setups a day was all. I made the whole picture in 147 setups. What do you want, soldier? Is Floyd Bowers here? Who? I guess I must have got the wrong room. This is the second floor, isn't it? Yeah. They didn't tell me which room it was. This friend of mine was in. It must be one of these rooms, though. His name is Floyd Bowers. You don't know anything about him? You better ask the superintendent. Now, you were in Crossfire, which was the last film Edward Demetric and Adrian Scott made at RKO. And of course, the late 40s were difficult times for some people. Were you aware of trouble brewing? Well, I probably was a bit more aware of it than they were. And, you know, having worked as a longshoreman and done things like that, and written for speeches for labor leaders. And uh, I would see Eddie Dimitri sitting there reading, uh, I guess, the Daily Worker of People's World, which, if nothing else, was one of the most blatantly Hold inept examples of journalism. It was at a time when it was sort of smart, you know, sort of chic, to be, uh, uh, to call yourself a communist. If uh, you made upwards of $1,000 a week, it was rather chic to be for the working man. Investigating communism in Hollywood, the Committee on Un-American Activities hears testimony of prominent film personalities. Louis B. Mayer, MGM production chief. Like others in the motion picture industry, I have maintained a relentless vigilance against un-American influences. If, as has been alleged, Communists have attempted to use the screen for subversive purposes. I am proud of our success in circumventing them. It is the prepared statement of the head of MGM, Louis B. Mayer, and of other so-called friendly witnesses, inaugurated the hearings of the House Un-American Activities Committee, which began sitting in October 1947. Among those subpoenaed to appear were Adrian Scott and Edward Dimitri. Did it take you by surprise, though? Clearly it, it did. It did take us by surprise, completely. My God, I was on top of the world at this point. I was the hottest director in Hollywood, and uh, uh, I really thought, uh, you know, nowhere to go but uh, onward and upward, and uh, the world was going to be the greatest thing in the world. Nothing but the greatest. You know, all of a sudden this thing came and really cut us down. Are you a member of the Communist Party? Or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? 
It's unfortunate and tragic that I have to teach this committee the that's basic principles the of Americanism. That's not the question. The question is, have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? I'm framing my answer in the only way in which any American citizen can frame his then answer you denied, to the question then which you, invades his, absolutely invades his Then you right. deny to, you, you refuse to answer that question, is that correct? I have told you that I will All offer right. my beliefs, my affiliations, and Here's everything the else Here's the to the American story. public, and they will know where I stand, as they do from what I have written. Stand away from the stand. I have written for Americanism for many years, and I stand shall away from the stand. fight for the Bill of Rights, which I'll you are trying to destroy. I'll stand away from the stand. It's almost impossible to create the uh, the feeling in Hollywood when when the when the Un-American Activities Committee uh, investigation burst on the scene. It was shock in general, and uh, and kind of a, a creeping fear that came into everyone. It was a, a, a very uneasy, frightening time because the people that you knew and that you were friends with and that you lunched with and saw occasionally at socially were suddenly all under great suspicion and their jobs were gone and their, their careers were ruined. We want to know whether well, you are a member of the Screenwriters Guild. Yes. Now that's a very simple question. You can answer that yes or no. You don't have to go into a long harangue. Answer the question yes or no. If, if, if you did, for instance, ask somebody about that, you might ask him... Well, uh, now, never mind what we might ask him. We're asking you no. now, are you a member of the Screenwriters but, Guild? But You're an American, but, but that's the and question. the American shouldn't uh, be afraid to answer that. RKO is divided between liberals and conservatives to some extent. Uh, I'd say I fit someplace in the middle of the road, because I survived. Others weren't as fortunate. Uh, Dimitrik... Scott would have taken the consequences of their political views. The position of the so-called unfriendly witnesses at the Washington hearings was that the line of questioning pursued by the investigators violated the Bill of Rights. They knew furthermore from witnesses who had cooperated that the follow-up questions involved naming names. The core of resistance to the committee were eight Hollywood writers, together with one producer, Adrian Scott, and one director, Edward Dimitrik. The Hollywood Ten. Did you feel you were properly supported by RKO, or could they, how did they re react? They didn't support me at all. Uh, they didn't, and all the studios uh, just collapsed, absolutely collapsed. There was no, uh, you know, no, uh, they talked big at the beginning and then absolutely folded because they were afraid of public pressure. We will not re-employ any of the ten until such time as he is acquitted or has purged himself of contempt and declares under oath that he is not a communist. We will not knowingly employ a communist or a member of any party or group which advocates the overthrow of the government of the United States by force or by any le illegal or unconstitutional methods. All studios agreed that they would fire the people who were designated as uh, part of the unfriendly 10. And uh, uh, we had uh, Archeo and Adrian, Scott and Dimitrik, and I think that was all. And uh, so they had to go. And uh, it was too bad, it was a shame, I think. Uh, but it happened to a lot of people. It happened to just some people who were very undeserving of that happening to them. I don't think anybody was deserving of having it happen to them, but there were degrees of, of uh, uh, leaning toward a communistic attitude. It has never been proven and never will be for a very simple reason, because it did not exist. It has never been proven that any form of communism ever infiltrated into the motion pictures that were there, despite all the fine combing that was done to make that seem possible. Who could get propaganda into films? I used to say that to people. Does anybody think that, that uh, here I am working for a studio, RKO, RCA, working for all these people uh, of capitalists. Uh, uh, does anybody think that they're so stupid that I could put propaganda into a film that the working man would recognize, but that these characters wouldn't? Absolutely ridiculous. And I don't think anybody ever did. We talked about human beings. We talked about poor. We talked about uh, mistreatment, but we didn't... Uh, we didn't talk revolution or anything like that. Never, you know. According to Leela Rogers, the mother of Ginger, 
the wily communists were easily able to infiltrate the script departments. Mrs. Rogers testified to the House Un-American Activities Committee in October 1947. Because a communist is very careful, very clever, and very devious in the way he sets the film. If I would give you a line from that play uh, straight out, you would say, what is wrong with that line? Unless you knew that the communist is trying in every way to tear down our free enterprise system, to make the people lose faith in it. But the American people, <laughs> they think that a communist is a man with bushy eyebrows and a great, huge Russian beard. They can't believe that they could be American citizens. I can't believe it myself. I don't understand it. But they are, and pretty too. The RKO production chief, Dory Sherry, was now in an extraordinary position. Under the directive of the Hollywood producers, he had to fire Scott and Dimitrik, although he himself had fostered and encouraged the socially committed pictures that had landed them in trouble in the first place. Was there any truth in something which was said at the time, which was that uh, they were the kind of sacrificial offering, and that the... By who? Uh, that the producers had said, if, if give us the Hollywood 10, and there'll be no blacklist. I think that's uh, nonsense. I think if there was any sacrificial offering that was on the part of the Communist Party to um, use those ten as, um, as just being expendable. Dory Sherry uh, was ashamed, of course, and there was nothing he could do. His hands were tied. But uh, when we were called in just the day before Thanksgiving, Dory had been asked to fire us or give us the ultimatum, and, and uh, he refused. He, he left town. At least he did that. He was too ashamed to do that, and, and uh, so that uh, Peter Rathlin was the guy that did it. But, uh, oh no, they, all the studios uh, fell apart. May 1948, in a move labeled the biggest motion picture transaction since 20th century took over Fox, RKO was bought by Howard R. Hughes, the fabulously wealthy owner of the Hughes Tool Company, TWA, and many other big businesses. At first, nothing seemed to change. Hughes himself was strangely invisible, but there was apprehension in the air. Hughes was known to have a reputation for eccentricity and indeed for fits of highly irrational behavior. And he was known to be no friend to liberals. I went to war when I came back. It was, I went to work in the district attorney's office. And when uh, Howard Hughes bought our KO, I was recommended for the job of building a dossier on everyone in the studio that was making over $1,500 a week. See, Howard had a, a constant eagerness to know all there was to know about anyone he was going to play or do business with. And we had had that unfriendly 10 situation, and RKO seemed to be the, the university, the university, RKO seemed to be the uh, studio that had more people that were interested in going back and being unhappy about our form of government. And uh, I think that Mr. Hughes got a little excited about it, and so I started out that way. Born Ann Lowry, Chicago, Illinois. Father Fred Lowry, architectural draftsman. Mother's maiden name not known. Both parents deceased. At time of parents' death, subject had recently... When did recently... you come to California? In June 1945, subject moved to California with her brother, Don. Reason not known. My brother attended university. She was employed by Masson and Company decorators. Opened her own establishment in January 1947. A dossier was needed by Mr. Hughes because he found that lots and lots of his people, capable people, belonged to the Communist Party. And he wanted, his attitude was, go ahead, but admit it. If I ever ask you and you say no, that takes care of it. He did that to Dory Sherry, who was the head of studio. He asked Dory Sherry a direct question. Are you a communist? Mr. Sherry answered by saying, uh, well, I'm an extreme liberal. So Hughes said, all right, fine, I've got an enemy. And uh, they parted company very quickly. See. He was a flag-waving American, this Mr. Hughes. 
Don, part of my job, as I see it, is to keep the commie minority from running the union. Why tell me? I'm no commie and you know it. Well, of course you're not. You think you're a good union man, don't you, Don? Then how would you like to see the commies take over the union and dump it in the ash can when they get through using it? Are you really afraid of that? Yes, and you should be too. Because if people like you don't wake up, they might get away with it. How many commies do we have in the union? Only a few. Well, what can they do? Plenty. They know how. Just a select few. But every one of them is an active party agent. Well, so you used you. to check up on people's... What did you do? What, Her in, the political affiliation established the fact that they belong to a cell. Uh, what they did with their money, if I could find it out. What they did with their social life. These are things that one does. The same thing that the FBI would do today, you know, set that kind of thing. If they were an unfriendly person around, you know. The, uh, is that clear? Yeah. Yes. Howard Hughes' anti-communist film, The Woman on Pier 13, may not be strong on analysis, but its blend of politics and sex is uniquely his own. Hughes' original title was, I Married a Communist. I couldn't lie to you if I wanted to, Doc. I'm really in love with you. Me or the commie party? I've been told you're a commie agent. Who told you that? Jim Travis. What did he say? I want you to tell me exactly. He said you've been using me. The way you used plenty of others before me. Well, what about it? I'm sorry it turned out this way. It's still to the writing of the period. Because the a writer had two things at stake. He had his home and family and a lifestyle. And his principles. And it was a great fight. Could he afford his principles and be thrown out of work during this trying period? Or could he see it through and compromise so that his lifestyle could continue? I guess we all faced this someplace en route in our life. Deprived of their livelihoods, the original Hollywood 10 now faced the prospect of jail sentences for contempt. The Senate committee hearings continued into the 50s in an atmosphere of mounting paranoia. Star witnesses like actor Larry Parks broke down under questioning and confessed to political indiscretions naming colleagues and extending the net still wider. Among the second wave of unfriendly witnesses was RKO screenwriter Paul Jericho. I was dismissed before I actually appeared before the committee. I was, I was dismissed the day that uh, the newspapers had a story about my having been subpoenaed. And I made a statement saying that if I had to uh, crawl in the mud with Larry Parks or go to jail like my courageous friends, the Hollywood Den, you might be, may be sure I'd choose the latter. I mean, I made a strong statement, and, and I certainly was not at all surprised that I was fired the same day. Uh, but it was the same day. I arrived at the, at, the, at the studio, and I was barred from the lot, uh, and I couldn't even get in to pick up my papers and my whiskey. I mean, it was terrible. <laughs> they were tried and declared guilty. They appealed their cases. Uh, uh, I was identified uh, with the Ten, not. and I produced a film okay. under my own name uh, about prison. the Hollywood Ten Three on the eve of their seven. going to jail in the summer of 1950. Adrian Scott, screenwriter and motion picture producer. Born in New Jersey, 39 years old. This film studio considered Scott's services invaluable. His films were successful and celebrated. Now Adrian Scott is in a federal prison. Edward Dimitri, 41 years old, motion picture director. These films and many others were directed by Edward Dimitri. As a reward for his distinguished contribution to world films, one year in prison. Well, I could have gotten out of going to jail, but uh, well, I went so that people wouldn't accuse me of backing out simply to keep out of going to jail, you yeah. How did, did that, did you find that experience particularly shattering, difficult? It's a combination. It was shattering because Jeannie and I were apart for that time. Jeannie was on her own. I think Jeannie had a much worse time than I did because there she was, she had a, she had a child. She had a struggle on her own, oh, had no money. The money had been all spent before, uh, beforehand. As a matter of fact, there were only about five of the 10 who were, had been working at all. The other hadn't been working for a long time. So we were supporting the whole damn thing. Uh, toward the end, we weren't getting much money from the public to pay the lawyers. Um, so she was the one that really had to struggle. Well, I was pretty naive about it at the time and uh, didn't understand a lot that uh, had to be explained <coughs> to me very fast. I learned pretty quickly. And um, when Eddie said that um, 
he knew he would go to jail. I did not think he would ever go to jail. I hadn't done anything wrong as far as I, I could, you know, on Tuesday at the studio, everything was fine. On Thursday, he's given a subpoena. He's still the same man. He, oh, same beliefs, same principles, lived the same. Um, never changed all the way down the line. Um, his going to jail was all wrong, but um, he did, I think he did exactly what he thought was best all the time, and I was very proud of him. And on his release from jail, with no prospect of further employment in the motion picture industry, Dimitri decided to testify after all. He named names which he claimed were already known to the committee, and therefore not significant. But many of his former colleagues have never forgiven him for this action. Did you support each other, the people who were involved, you and Adrian and... Uh, At the beginning, of course we did, yeah. Yeah, I backed out on the group, as you know, after I... But at first I served my jail sentence, and then because I was... I was, I had learned a very bitter lesson about the Communist Party as such, and I no longer, I wanted to separate myself from the Communist Party, and that was the only way to do it, because I was inextricably tied up with that, unless I made some very strong move, and it was the only way to get away. It was yours and being seen coming out of the FBI office. I told you, I don't even know where the office Howard is. Howard Hughes' personal campaign against communism dramatized in simplistic and rabid terms the kind of vengeance meted out to backsliders by the party. I tell you, I don't know anything about... Strange, isn't it, how a man will try to turn against his friends and believe he can get away with it. Take him out. Mr. Manning, I tell you, this is a mistake. I've always been absolutely loyal. The film is a pretty good reflection of the collective paranoia of the early 50s. As the Washington hearings continued, and more and more Hollywood people found themselves under suspicion. Though perhaps only Hughes could have so weirdly conflated Moscow with Chicago as the party zealots meet out their punishment. Don't. Oh, God. Don't. Okay. Please don't. 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 No. 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 This fear didn't really get uh, pervasive until the committee hit Hollywood again in the spring of 51, and the 10 became hundreds, literally hundreds. Um, uh, so th at that point, it's really, it's really 51, 52, that you began to get this, this dreadful pall of fear. I, the blacklist is nothing. At least we knew what we were, uh, what, why we were blacklisted. The gray list, which was far, far, far greater, uh, those poor bastards didn't know uh, uh, what they were bl being blamed for or why they couldn't work, but they couldn't work. And I think it, that was where it was really terribly, terribly unfair. If somebody commits a crime or a sin or what's considered a crime, what the hell you pay for it? You know what you're doing? You walk into it wide open, you know, with, with your eyes wide open. You can object, but you know what, what, what it's for. But these characters didn't. And uh, why they should pay, why they should suffer, why they, you know, I, I never could understand that. I am defending Go ahead, ask the right the next not only of ourselves, are you but a of member the of the Communist Party? Have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? The Communist Party? Well, are you uh, now, have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? Here in the archive, we found files with the names of many former RKO employees still ringed in red, indicating the studio's doubt about their political past. The heroic comradeship of the war had been destroyed by suspicion, turning to hatred and personal enmity. It seems as if the film business has never quite gotten over this terrible period. The ghosts of McCarthy and his like are still around. Back then in the early 50s, much of the responsibility for the RKO witch hunt has to rest with Howard Hughes. His personal war against communism extended to removing the credits of politically suspect employees from films as far back as 1931. In the next Tales from Hollywood, we examine Hughes' own highly idiosyncratic contribution to filmmaking in the 50s. We examine Hughes' curious and secretive dealings with his employees at RKO, as well as his meticulous personal attention to the careers of his female stars.